I had the gayest haircut. <laughs> that it, it was kind of like a T-Boss situation. Oh, wow. <laughs> but like, you know, it was like an asymmetrical kind of like flip over kind of thing. And I have... What's up, everybody? And welcome to the Queerly Black Show. I'm your host, Ashley, and I'm so happy you came by. The Queerly Black Show aims to normalize the everyday existence of black LGBTQIA plus individuals through an interview style series with regular folks like you and me. So every week, a new guest shares their story and unique perspective on their existence as an LGBTQIA plus individual. Thank you for tuning in and make sure you subscribe, download, set your reminders to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Enjoy the show. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Queerly Black Show. I'm your host, Ashley Harris. We are here with a special, special guest, one-third of the Minority Report, Mr. (laughs) Dewan Hawkins. Yeah. Mr. Dewan, go ahead and tell the people about yourself. (laughs) Yeah. um, So a little bit about me. Um, So Dewan Hawkins, I co-host Minority Report podcast. I uh, am based out of Harlem, New York, um, a native Ohioer, um, Ohioan. And uh, um, I identify as gay, um, you know, although I've been leaning more towards the queer, um, the queer category, I guess. Um, I don't know. I've been finding that to be quite interesting, um, you know, and a lot of other people are, are, are in that, that camp of, you know, redefining who they identify as. But yeah, um, I identify as, as a gay man, gay black man. And, um, you know, it's, it's just it's good to, to talk with another another podcaster, another black uh, podcaster that's, you know, having their voice on the air and using their platform for representation and sharing our story. So I'm excited to be here. Yes, I'm excited to have you. <laughs> so I want to go ahead and jump right in. I, I, uh, you know, you, you kind of alluded to it. But one thing I do like to understand is like how people identify and what, um, you know, in terms of pronouns and this just very evolved language uh, in the queer world. So for you, mm-hmm. Uh, identifying as a gay man, but then, you know, kind of leaning more towards uh, the the queer diaspora, if you will. Um, what's that? What's that journey for you right now? Yeah, you know, um, it's it's a it's a process of of self reflection and and self realization and just trying to figure out, you know, what what fits. You know, it's like for me, it's like finding a pair of of jeans. You know. Um, it's 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 and that can be a, a long journey it's finding a tough that process perfect, sometimes that, <laughs> that perfect pair of jeans but uh you know i predominantly identify as gay um you know from a sexual attraction standpoint i'm, I'm definitely attracted to men but you know I, I i feel like um the notion of queer um has a, a more inclusive connotation to it and um and i think as i as i think about labels and what you know, what that means for, you know, just like people within our community and the intersectionality of, you know, the black and the, the LGBTQIA plus community, um, you know, I'm, I'm just embracing more inclusive language. And so um, doesn't change, you know, my, my, my sexual preferences, but I think in terms of identity, um, I feel very comfortable in the space of, you know, being referred to as gay or being referred to as, uh, as queer. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And I've been, you know, in this process because me, I, I'm i just like, I'm a lesbian. I like women, <laughs> feminine women. That's kind of it, right? But I'm uh-huh. learning that there's so much more to it. And I think um, the identity part being a very specific one, because I think when people hear gay or lesbian, they just assume you're talking about sexual, like sexual identity. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, with this uh, kind of evolution, it's about your identity as a human, not yeah. just like who I sleep with. It's like, yeah. but who am I as a person? Um, and so it's a, it's a cool journey to like listen to people and how they arrive at that place. And so you, you know, very, very confident man. Um, you have one of the best <laughs> selfie mirrors I've ever seen. Your pictures are awesome <laughs> on your IG. Oh, thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, Let's go back to the beginning. So um, when were you first faced with your sexuality? Um, I recall I was probably, I don't know, like four or five or something like that when, um, you know, I my first memory of of having some kind of attraction to a man was 
um, you know, back in the day when uh, the first Superman movie came out. And um, I remember um, we went to go see it, loved it. I was a little kid or whatever. And I remember having a dream that night um, that, <laughs> that I was, and again, mindset of, you know, I, I'm four or five years old, so I don't, it's not about sex, but it's about like, you know, like roles and things like that. But I remember dreaming that I was um, Superman's wife and, but I was me, I wasn't a woman and I was cooking dinner in his crystal cabin and whatever. If you ever saw that the original movie, you know, he has like this crystallized kind of like layer that's in like the North Pole or whatever. Um, and he used it to fly around and stuff. And I remember vividly having a dream about me being, you know, in my mind, his version of his wife and waiting for him to fly home from saving the world and I'm cooking him dinner. <laughs> You're Superman's wife. <laughs> yeah. So That's uh, it's, it's, cool. been, <laughs> it's been ever since then. <laughs> Four years old. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> But right, right before kindergarten. <laughs> yeah, but I wow. just I remember, you know, I re I remember being very aware of my, um, and I'm gonna say attraction or gravitation, you know, towards other men. Um, and again, you know, obviously not at at that age. It really wasn't about sex, but it was just it was, you know, what you're drawn to, right? The things that you were you know interested in, and obviously even at that young age. Um, and then, of course, getting older, you know, dealing with the realization that those thoughts and those feelings are not like, you know, I had an older brother, I have, you know, cousins that were there were boys and, you know, it wasn't lining up to what they were <laughs> dreaming about and thinking mm -hmm. about and whatnot. So it's like at a very young age, um, you know, I understood the the um, the impact of difference. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that that took a long time, you know, talk about the journey. It took a long time you know, for me to get to a place of feeling very comfortable, you know, being in my own skin and, and, and expressing, you know, who I am from a orientation perspective and just from a personality perspective, you know? So, um, so yeah, but that, that really early on, I had that realization of, you know, being different and, um, and, and starting to work through that process. Yeah. So when you, uh, first, uh, when, when people are getting girlfriends and, you know, linking up, going through school, uh, were you linking mm. up with boys or linking up no. with girls? I was, I was, a okay. So I am a, I'm a late bloomer in that department. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I was very much a, a nerd and, um, and super sensitive, creative kind of like guy. I was very social, um, you know, very like, you know, like, into like hanging out with people and things like that. But um, because I also, you know, identified, even at that point, I hadn't said the words out loud, but, um, you know, like junior high, elementary school, high school, um, you know, I knew that I was, I knew that I was gay. I finally understood what it was. Um, and that was the secret that I was holding. Um, but yeah, you know, just um, trying to come to terms to what does that mean for me? And, and I just never, I felt obligated not to get into relationships with girls because I felt like I couldn't, it wouldn't be fair to them. I always remember, you know, having that as, and I don't want to call it like a moral compass, but like, mm -hmm. I just, I never wanted to get into a situation where like, A, I was put it, I was put in a situation where I felt pressure that I might have to have sex with this girl. <laughs> <laughs> I know that sounds horrible <laughs> to say, but you know, yeah. I mean, you know, at, at that point, you know, uh, You're like I'm gonna let her it, down because like, it ain't no, I, I just, it, it just it didn't make sense. It didn't make yeah. sense for me to like put myself in those situations. You know, I obviously felt pressure to like you know try to date, and I did. And you know, by the time I was a sophomore in high school, I started dating, uh, and I basically dated this girl from <laughs> sophomore in high school all the way to like my sophomore year in uh, in college, and. Uh, not the great, greatest relationship we were, <laughs> uh, it was, it, fortunately enough, she had a very um, strong Christian family upbringing. And so the pressure to like, you know, perform sexually didn't really come up because mm -hmm. saving yourself from marriage and I was a good Christian boy and, you know, da, 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 da. Um, but uh, eventually, you know, we, we had to go our separate ways and I needed to, you know, um, lean more into my own sexuality and recognize who I was and, you know, try to be my authentic self. So, um, so yeah, it was well into my, 
um, my college years uh, that, um, you know, I really started embracing my, my homosexuality, you know, not just, uh, you know, having thoughts and, and ideas and doing things secretly, uh, not necessarily like hooking up with guys, because I didn't do that until I was, I didn't go on my first date with a guy until I was, I think, 21. So mm -hmm. it, it, you really allowed time. yourself to understand it and like be clear about uh, how you were going to proceed with things. Yeah, I, yeah. I think f for me, f for me, I chose um, the route of creating my own sense of independence as my path to coming out um, because you know at that time and still today, you know, um, I just didn't have the confidence that um, that I would be one hundred percent accepted, and I was very, very naive um, about life. Book smart, not necessarily street smart. So, you know, the notion about how would I make it on my own if, you know, my, my parents kicked me out or my family disowned me or whatever, um, you know, all of those things were going in my head. So I just kind of, um, I relegated myself to a, a, a safer path for me to carve out my own independence. And by the time that I was a sophomore in high school, I had started working a lot more and I started getting a sense of like, you know, living on my own and being able to support myself and all of those kinds of things that gave me a lot more confidence to be able to, you know, live a life that's a little bit more out and proud. Uh, but it did take me, um, when I say that, that's kind of two stages. I'm sure you probably have, and a lot of folks have a similar experience. It's like you come out to like your circle of friends first mm -hmm. <laughs> and build yeah. that community. And then you come out to your family, um, you know, if, you know, if that's your path. So you can lean back mine. on the friends so when the family like. Yeah. And <laughs> you yeah, <laughs> but, uh, you know, fortunately enough, you know, my family was, was quite accepting and, and, and all of that. And they still very much are, but you know, I just didn't know. I just yeah. didn't know. So I was just preparing myself for like the worst. Yeah, it is. It's a huge fear for people because it's, I think because you, you recognize it so early and then like, you're like when you're you're talking about like four right so when you're four years old and everyone's playing house and it's a girl and a boy and you're like but i don't want to be right. <laughs> you know it's the, the, the contrast but i'm superman's like, wife i'm right. superman's wife <laughs> you're having dreams about right. being superman's wife and everybody else is like yeah we were playing house and i'm the mom and dad and, it, and you're like yeah. i don't it, so this the i think because you're faced with it so early it's like so scary and because you hear so many things and, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you know, growing up in church and you hear all these things. And so you just never know, like, how people are going to respond. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, I'm with you. I'm like, look, housing and food is much more important <laughs> than, like, me wanting to be just, like, sexually free. Like, right. I, need to eat, I need this warm house. We can figure this out when I got a paycheck coming in. <laughs> you know, so. Well and I think I think the value of like um, what like what you're doing right now from a representation perspective is is um, you can't put a price on how how valuable that is because for me um, you know growing up um, growing up gay in the 80s and into the 90s so you know I'm a, I'm a 70s born baby but I grew up mostly in the 80s um, and um, 80s and 90s um, enter college into the mid 90s and whatnot so um, you know at that point you know, there there were no positive um, portrayals, first of all, of just gay people, you know, mm -hmm. the queer community, gay people. There were no positive portrayals of that. Every, it was always a joke, you mm -hmm. know, look at that sissy, got, mm -hmm. you know, sugar in his tank, da, 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 da. It's always a joke or they're deviants, right? Um, so there's that, but then layer on the fact that, you know, I'm part of the black community and what that means, you know, and it's just like the extra pressure of, you know, toxic masculinity and all those kinds of things, um, coupled with the fact that you just, there's no blueprint, you know, there's no blueprint for, you know, someone who identifies as black and gay, you know, coming out and navigating those waters and find, you know, like when I came out, I came out into into, and I grew up in Ohio. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's, I mean, racially diverse in some regards, but in terms of like openness and whatnot, um, you know, not terribly open. And so I didn't have, I grew up in the suburbs of Cleveland. So I didn't have like a, you know, like a, a black gay community to come out to. So when I came out, um, you know, I came out while I was in college, I went to Kent State University, um, predominantly white school, predominantly white town, the nearest big city was Akron, Ohio, which wasn't that big at all. LeBron. You know, so, 
<laughs> so like racial diversity within the LGBTQ community that I could experience at that time was just not there. So, you know, it, it just having, you know, coming out is tough when you don't have, you know, stories that are uplifting and positive, or, you know, just people can understand and hear from other, other people who have gone through their similar experience. Um, and you can see through their eyes that there is light at the end of the tunnel. So flashback to me being, you know, eight, nine, 10 through, you know, through 18 years old, not having those portrayals of, of positive gay black men out there doing it and living their lives and being happy and healthy, having healthy relationships, et cetera. You know, that adds to the complexity of the secret, mm -hmm. you know, that I'm holding for all of that time. Yeah. Not very successfully, by the way, <laughs> based on my, my trail of, of, of Barbie dolls and, and you know, right. whatever other effeminate, you know, um, things that I was doing um, that really gave it away. But um, in my mind, I was, you know, holding firm that, you know, oh, yeah, well, you know, I could still pass it straight and da, 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 mm -hmm. um, you know, but it's having things like this you know, like yeah. people like you who are out there who are speaking out and sharing these stories that make it easier for young kids today to be able to do go through that journey a little bit more successfully. Yeah. Did you do you have um, siblings? I do. I have an older brother and a younger sister. OK, nice. Yeah. Yeah. And nice. we're, we're close in age. So, you know, we literally grew up together. You know, we're my brother and I are about uh, 13 months apart, 13, 14 months apart. And my sister and I are two and a half years apart. So we're quite close in age. So we kind of like like my best friends are my, you know, are my, my siblings, you know, and, and our extended cousins, because we would spend all of our time together. So yeah, no, same. Yeah. I, have two, I have two, I have two younger sisters, and uh, we're pretty close. We're within like four years of each other. Um, mm -hmm. I'm the oldest. So though. see, but that makes you the trailblazer. So you got to do everything first. Yeah, I'm the middle child. So yeah. I'm like, Jan, Jan, Jan. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think, uh, you know, being the oldest, it's, it's like, you know, you get those, you get those war scars. Cause you know, yep. you, you remember uh, tougher times than, um, <laughs> you know, the, the middle children and younger ones remember, uh -huh. you know, so you're, you're like, yeah, I remember when, uh, you know, it was, when it was tough for mom, you know, you, you know, by the time you were old enough, you know, you never had to wash your own down. clothes. <laughs> yeah. You didn't have to wash your own clothes until I left the house. You didn't have to right. wash dishes till I left, you know? So right. <laughs> this is stuff I was doing from 10. I left, I left to go to college at 17. So yeah. you got seven free years of, you know, so it, it, it is uh, fun. I do want to go talk, uh, talk a little bit about um, when you were growing up. Cause I remember uh, I talked to um, Tony and Jordan from the surface level podcast. Yeah. They were on. Yeah, those guys um, are great. Yeah. Those are uh, Jordan and I are actually from, um, both from New Jersey, from Trenton, and we went, we all oh, went really? to Howard together. Um, okay. And so Jor Jordan was talking about his coming out story and how, you know, uh, when he was growing up in Michigan, because he would go back and forth between Michigan and, and New Jersey, mm -hmm. and how, like, the only gay representation there was, like, a homeless guy who, like, would twist his shirt up like and wear like the little midriff situation uh -huh. and how, like, scary it was to, like, try to come out because that's the representation, right? <laughs> So it's like if if I'm like, oh, not be like that, that. that, then like what is he gonna say? Or um I remember one of my aunts, she's probably I think early 50s, and um mm. her and I had went out going Christmas shopping one time and she was like, you know, you're so normal. <laughs> and it was like because for her again, right, she's you know in her 50s, and so she's like yeah. all she knew was like, you know, just whatever kind of flat flaming whatever like extreme version of like you know yeah it, it was just very different so um for you because like 80s 90s that was like huge like you know that was like the AIDS epidemic that was like mm -hmm. all this very very scary stuff did you mm -hmm. did that form any of your thoughts in terms of uh, outside of wanting to be independent but like all of the things that were kind of happening around that time I was scared of shit to have sex. <laughs> Not gonna lie. I mean, I, I was, you yeah. know, um, even though, we, you know, we learned about, um, you know, how you can, by that point, you know, obviously, you know, you, you, we learned about, you know, protecting yourself with, uh, you know, with, with condom use and whatnot, especially, at, you know, uh, gay sex and whatnot. Um, 
but yeah, you know, I was just, again, I was not very street smart. I was very much a, you know, nose in the books, you know, creative, you know, kind of like type. I would like sit and draw and like, you know, daydream and like da 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 da. Um, so I kind of mm-hmm. like lived in my own fantasy world and like was very much, you know, um, you know, anti drugs, anti alcohol. I didn't have my first sip of alcohol till I was 20, literally on my 21st birthday. Um, you know, so like, that the notion of, you know, of, of HIV and AIDS was the narrative, the predominant narrative over, you know, homosexual lifestyle, you know? And so that was scary as shit. (laughs) I'm not going to lie. And so it's like, is it worth it? And there'll be times, you know, when you're, you know, a frustrated young gaby, right? Mm -hmm. And you're you're like craving some attention. You're like, well, I just might risk it all, you know? But, um, you know, fortunately enough, you know, I, I just, at least in my experience, you know, I, 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 I held on to education as, as a, a key component of that. And I just, I took my time, you know, I just, I think my fear, <laughs> my fear was a little bit of a protector for me. You know, yeah. it, 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 it prevented me from doing things that were a little bit more reckless, right? That if mm-hmm. perhaps I didn't have, um, you know, I didn't have that, I don't know, my, my life might have turned out a little bit differently. Um, and my fear of, you know, rejection, you know, from a familiar percent, from a family perspective, you know, delayed, you know, my, my coming out experience, you know, and I didn't, it wasn't until many years later that, you know, having conversation with like my mom and my dad and and others that, you know, I could have come out at eight and it would have been completely fine, you know? And so, um, it's just interesting when you look back on your life and you think about, you know, how you moved and navigated and what you learned out of that and how that shaped who you are today. Yeah. Did they, did they tell you later? Like we knew we just were waiting for you. Oh yeah. (laughs) Everybody, everybody knew every, every, oh my God. I mean, I, (laughs) I I think back to, I remember being in um, junior high and um, (laughs) I had the gayest haircut. (laughs) <laughs> that it, it was kind of like a t-boss situation oh, wow. <laughs> but like you know it was like an asymmetrical kind of like flip over kind of thing and i have uh i have uh curly hair and so <laughs> i would blow it out <laughs> to get it it just it they knew everybody <laughs> everybody everybody i wasn't fooling anybody <laughs> But just didn't have the courage to be able to, you know, to, to, to just lean into it, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, how has that perspective in, in kind of coming out later shaped how you view um, queer culture and, and things now? And I'll sp- I want to give a specific uh, kind of conversation. So I was watching um, in all of my uh, stalking and studying of you. Um <laughs> There was a, you guys had a conversation on a minority report about Dave Chappelle and Jay mm. was mm. like, not having it. He was like, <laughs> I am not, no, he is wrong. Yeah. And I, yeah. you know, he was just very, uh, his opinion was very different than mm-hmm. you. Where do you think, um, that difference comes from? Because I can, I kind of go, I kind of, depending on the issue, I kind of, mm-hmm. I can go either way. Right. I'm 31 and mm-hmm. For me, it's like some stuff I'm like, yeah. And then in in that situation, because I was Mm -hmm. also kind of like, I I understand, but the line is like, he's like tipping over it, but like Mm -hmm. staying on the other side, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Where do you think some of that difference comes from in terms of like, I'll say just generationally in terms of like the patience with certain things and kind of the cancel culture and like, uh, I would say, I, I would say people, even my age, like there's this, an extreme lack of empathy in terms of like people being able to understand certain things. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, so I always just take that extra step back and not be like the radical millennial that's like, I'm going to go <laughs> pick it, everything, right? I try to, uh-huh. you know, I try to like, okay, let me take a pause. Let me try to yeah. really understand. <laughs> and then like, let's proceed with like, you know, uh, some some thought here uh yeah. what's your thoughts on that i i think um you know so what's so question number one about like perspective um you know because i didn't feel like i had um uh, advocacy for me um someone out there that you know like a mentor or somebody that i can really like latch on to in those formative years you know i think that's shaped 
um, what I want in terms of how I want to move and navigate the world as a as an adult. 45, I'll be 46 this year, later this year. And um, one of the things that's been really important to me is giving back to my own community, you know, whether it's, you know, sharing whatever tidbits of wisdom I've got, you know, um, mentoring, you know, even how my career has been shaped and, 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 and really supporting the black community and, and honoring the representation that exists between the intersectionality of my queerness and my blackness, you know, so, you know, when it comes to, you know, like, these social issues like the Dave Chappelle um, uh, stand up and, and how, you know, his comments are um, perceived as hurtful um, or and potentially harmful for uh, the trans community. I understand that perspective. Um, and, you know, there's and there's va there's validity in that. So I, I don't take away from that. I think where I struggle and this is this is where that where the evolution of our language and evolution of our social understanding, you know, the intersection of that, where that's where that's coming into play, because, you know, I think it's kind of like comparing a bit to like the Me Too movement, right? Um, you know, when you are not part of that community, um, you know, how do you draw the line between what you believe and then how you how you act on on the information that you have? And so for the Dave Chappelle situation, I was really just kind of of the mindset that, you know, I'd, I would never take away from the, um, the, the, the perception of the harm that, that um, certain kind of language has on communities. And there's a certain kind of a responsibility that, uh, that we all have to be careful about the choice of our words and, 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 and be intentional about how we want to come across. I think where I struggled a little bit with, with the, the day thing is that um, it's that fine line. Um, and this is education, a point, a point yeah. for continued education and awareness for me, I'm just saying, uh, where, where do you draw the line between, you know, what's on and off limits from a comedic standpoint? Yeah. You know, so when I think back to just, you know, growing up black, we make fun of everything. Mm -hmm. Your, you know, great granddaddy could be in a casket, and if if he got a booger on his nose, even in that casket, somebody's gonna make a, make a comment about mm -hmm. that, you know. And so it's, I'm not saying it's right or wrong because maybe that's a that's a, that's reflection of like you know the trauma of our black community and how we have to laugh through things, otherwise we're gonna cry through things. So there's a whole bunch of things that are at play, um, but it's like where do you draw the line? Yeah. You know, so I think for me, for some people, it's black and white. It's yeah, like, very. <laughs> you know, this community said this is wrong. This is her feeling. He shouldn't be doing no more. Da, 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 da. And then others are, you know, like, well, you know, um, how far is too far <laughs> in, yeah. in this conversation? And where is the line? You know, is there a line? And if there is a line in terms of decency and respect and da, 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 even in the context of comedy, which should be a little bit irreverent, um, has a history of being irreverent. Um, you know, where, where does the line? So that's just, I think for me, it's just a matter of recognizing, um, what do I think right now? What's influencing the way that I think? Is it, you know, leftover toxic masculinity, yeah. you know, kind of like vibes from just growing up, you know, mm -hmm. and da, 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 da. Is it societal norms of where we are right now? And, you know, we're shifting the dialogue, you know, when the Me Too movement happened, you know, there are a lot of people that weren't on board with mm -hmm. this concept of me too and they're just you know they're like why did they wait so long da, da, all these kinds of things but i think there's a moment um in our culture where there's a certain amount of awareness that happens is oh wow you know my thinking has been shaped more by what they want me to think versus you know from a humanitarian you know empathetic from an empathetic place yeah. so i think the the lines are shifting and we're just becoming a little bit more educated and I'm not a guy that's that's steeped in absolutes just to begin with. Right, you know? right, yeah. So because it eliminates the process, like the 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 critical thinking process gets eliminated, and you want to have those dialogues where you can learn from other perspectives and you can kind of yeah. feel where people are coming from. Because me, you know, I I think um, a joke is a joke, right? And mm -hmm. I take it as that. But I think that when you're trying to because even in our conversations, right? Like you and I are not that 
different in age in terms of like the scope of time right mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. how far we've progressed from when you were growing up and mm-hmm. then when I was growing up and then now mm-hmm. with you know kids now who are like 11 and look just like me and I would never be able to walk in my house like this you know so like yeah. that progression so I think when you're trying to build up that case and you're trying to kind of p- pad or put put positivity into a certain, like infuse positivity into a certain uh, group of people when that kind of thing happens and he's black and he's Mm -hmm. a man, Mm -hmm. it makes it hard for that conversation to be uh, validated by people Mm -hmm. that you needed to be validated by. And I think that's the other side, right? But for me, it's like, you know, I can see where it's a joke and it's just a joke and I'm going to keep moving because he talks about gay people. He talks about, you know, you know, dykes and all this other like crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. But I understand how, to your point, depending on where that's coming from for you and where you've Mm -hmm. arrived in your journey, that can be scary because like you hear Dave Chappelle talking about transgender people in this way and you're transitioning Mm -hmm. and no one knows you, you're, you're rap, you're grappling with all these feelings that can like, you know, recess you 10 steps, but you love Dave Chappelle. So what do you do? (laughs) We've, we've, especially being black, we've all been in a roasting session. Oh, for sure. Where it's going back and forth, back and forth. And then that is that one joke, that one roast, that one thing (laughs) that hits you the wrong way. And then you get in your feelings, you know, and it's like, it it just takes a a, a fun thing. (laughs) You just go right up to that light. Now all the glass and all the, okay. (laughs) Now Now we're ready to fight. That one night in your family function. Yeah. It's like, all right, everybody got to go. Yep. Y- y'all talk about people, baby daddies now. Y'all talk about <laughs> gay stuff. Y'all got to go. For y'all tear my house up. Yep. <laughs> I got this china in here. Get on it'd out. It'd be like that. So, like, like that. and I, I do appreciate what I do appreciate about um, that situation, the totality of that situation is that it, 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 it raises the level of the conversation. Yeah. You know, sure. so. It, you know, when you have somebody who has who's such a high profile as Dave Chappelle, who is a comedic genius in terms of mm-hmm. the way that he thinks about how he tells stories and the way he thinks about crafting the the actual joke, right? Um, just stellar, you know, stellar, hyperstellar, uh, creative talent there, and a superstar in that re- in that realm. It also provided a really great platform for these kind of conversations to mm-hmm. happen, to help evolve our conversation and empathy for the transgender community. So, you know, I'm grateful for those. It's just like, um, you know, like with Dwayne Wade and, mm-hmm. you know, and his daughter, um, Zaya. Mm-hmm. Your, Zaya, Zaya. I was mm-hmm. say, your Zaya, thank you. You know, like they're going through that journey in a very, and they're very public people. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, when you look at pictures of Zaya and doing, you know, her just, expressing herself um, and going through that journey and being in the public eye, you see all these comments on social media that are so coming from a, uh, a negative place, you know, a judgmental yeah. place, you know, and, Definitely. you know, it's interesting because those things are, are there's value in, in that, in that expression, because now we can have a, a much higher level conversation, you yeah. know, um, not necessarily for the focus of changing people's minds, but really just helping people to unpack. Why do you believe the way that you believe? Yeah. And, you know, is that, is that serving? Is it serving you? Is it serving society? You know, is it serving both? You know, is it mutually serving, you know, or is it self-serving, right? To have yeah. that particular view. And what does a, you know, a toddler to, you know, to, to, to teenager expression of who they are creatively, um, their their identity, whatever, have anything to do with you personally, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, so it allows, it elevates the conversation, you know, to not necessarily focus on what the person is doing that they're reacting to, but really shift it to what's the reaction and why are we having that reaction? Mm-hmm. And is the reaction that we're having serving us from a community standpoint? Yeah, for sure. And I think it, it's, I love Zaya. I think it's incredible what they're doing um, and mm-hmm. just allowing her to be as, as every kid yeah. should be, right? <laughs> um, Isn't it wild? Isn't it wild though that especially within our like the black community, and I think there's, you know, th- there's generational um, reasoning behind that, especially you know being you know slave de- descendants and things of that nature. Um, you know this notion of, you know, 
really um, crafting what your life is supposed to be like. We have all these sayings like, you know, don't be airing our dirty laundry out there. You know, mm-hmm. don't be, you know, spilling our secrets. What and happens in this house stays in this house. Right. And so it's, you know, it, it breeds a culture of secrecy and it breeds a culture of, of people who are um, unable to just, just authentically be who they are. Mm-hmm. Um, not giving license for people to be like assholes and jerks, but like, you know, if you express yourself creatively in a different way, if you're, if your gender expression is different, like all of those things have become tab had become taboos and, and for no reason, no there's reason. no, mm-hmm. there's no genetic reason for us to be driven in this way. So it's all societal, which means that how so many people grow up repressing mm-hmm. who they are. And unfortunately, many people don't even aren't even at, in a position where they can come out from that to realize who they are as their authentic selves, you know, and then you have some people who realize who they are and lean into it, you know, at certain costs much later, but it's just like, imagine what this world could be like, you know, if kids growing up, going from today, going forward without the fear of, oh, I have to conform to what, you know, my parents, my society, my, my schools, my whatever, think that I should be and I can just be myself. If mm-hmm. I if I love broccoli <laughs> and that's the only thing that I like, you I'm know, just like broccoli all the time. <laughs> just, you know, the sprinkle in a couple other things so you can have a, a balanced diet, <laughs> yeah. but broccoli on. You know, yeah. if you're if you're effeminate, if you're if you're if you're more masculine and and you know you're you're you, you know you're you're and and you don't feel like your outside is matching who you are on your inside, having the space and the support like a support mm-hmm. system around you that it allows you to just explore what that is without putting a lot of extra pressure on what it should be. It's going to be huge for our next generation, I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think it, I, I love it when I see just like young people who don't have, who won't have to deal with that. You know, I think mm-hmm. it's so, it's so much when you're like an adult trying to like unwind that and mm-hmm. you learn that you, you go and you have these conversations of coming out and you know, the, the, gloom and doom of the that journey and you realize that all it is is people are like well what is such and such gonna say and you're like i don't Mm -hmm. even care about them so i've been like living miserably because of what what some (laughs) like what they're gonna say about me like i don't care (laughs) you know so i love it i love it um so now for you functioning in um your uh greatness today um (laughs) how how do you balance uh your masculinity and just the parts of you that people would identify as more feminine so for example liking flowers and yeah. uh there was a picture wearing of wigs like your 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 bathing suit cover up uh, oh, which yeah, actually yeah. my wife saw no I didn't even see it she's like oh look he has on a kimono I was like what's a kimono so I was like oh a bathing suit cover up <laughs> you know but balancing you know all of the elements yeah. of uh, who you are, you know, and still maintaining that, you know, you're a man. And I think the opposite yeah. is, you know, me, I'm very much a woman. I don't have any desire to be a man at all, but sweatpants and a hat is just more comfortable for me. Dope. Um, how do Love you, it. how do you work through that journey? Um, I, I, if, I mean, it, it came to fruition with a lot of soul searching and a lot of just challenging myself to just accept like, this is how I'm wired. And I think, you know, the the pain and frustration that I think we all experience with trying to run away from how we are wired, what we running away from the things that we like, the things that bring us joy, the things that bring us happiness, the things that we're naturally gravitating towards, the more that we run away from, away from that, the more we are denying who we are and how we express ourselves. And so, you know, for me, it's just, this is a lifelong journey. I mean, I feel like, you know, when I, uh, started coming out in my 20s, um, you know, that was that was just a a, a a whole decade of just like experimentation and trying to figure some shit out and try to unpack blah, blah, blah. But I felt like when I got into my 30s, um, I really started to unpack, you know, like what does my, my gayness, my queerness really mean? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, why do I do the things that I do? Um, and I think today, um, you know, I just, I, I feel very, uh, you know, liberated you know, to, and empower to be able to express myself however I want to express myself. Um, you know, so, you know, um, yeah, so I'll, you know, so in terms of balancing, you know, like my, my masculine and, and feminine qualities, you know, it's, 
really just about allowing them to authentically express themselves. However, like if there's a day, like there'll be a day, I have a, a, a wig collection. I just, I'm, uh -oh. I love wigs. Blonde? Um, uh, I've, have more I've fun blonde, now. I have blonde, I've got <laughs> amber, I've got, you know, like black, I've got, you know, I've got a, a, all different kinds of textures and blah, blah, blah. And it, it's one of those things where it's, it's, I don't, it's not about like cross-dressing because I'm not really into, you know, like, um, you know, like wearing women's clothes and things like that. Does it, that, it doesn't bring me joy, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. Um, but for some reason, I love me a wig. And fortunately, I'm on a podcast with two other, you know, black gay men that also loves to, you know, put on a wig from time to time. And I just find that when when I'm wearing a wig, if I'm just like, you know, doing chores around the house or just watching TV or whatever, it, it it's not about going out and shocking any. It's like, it's like the thing that you do for yourself, mm -hmm. you know. And so for me, it's about leaning more into, you know, the things that are bringing me joy. And yeah. if if wearing a, you know, a you know, flowing <laughs> kimono on a trip, you know, on a beach vacation or wearing a wig or, you know, for people who, you know, you know, guys who paint their fingernails or whatever it is that, that we deem as feminine, right? Um, it's, that's, it's, 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 it's fake. Like this notion that things are feminine and things are masculine is bullshit. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at, you know, look at 200 years ago, you know, men were wearing dresses and, mm -hmm. and, and powdered wigs and, Cat you kilts. know, and, and all this, all this other kind of shit. So it's like, for me, it's really just about, you know, just operating more authentically. You know, if it's bringing me joy, if it's something, if I see something, I'm like, oh, you know, if, if tomorrow I'm walking down, you know, and I, I, I walk across like a, 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 a you know, like a clothing store and I see like a, you know, like a, a bralette or something, you know, and I'm like, you know what, that looks really cute. And I think I would look cute in it. And if I'm compelled to buy it, then I'll buy it. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll wear it however it is that I, I, I want to wear it, um, you know, and I'm cool with that. <laughs> and yeah, if, pe sure. if anybody else doesn't like it, that's on them because, you know, they're, you know, they are not me, they're not living my life. And, you know, what brings me joy doesn't have to bring you joy. Um, but as long as I'm happy and I'm not hurting anybody, um, you know, then, you know, the more that I can lean into those things that are bringing me joy, the happier I'm going to be yeah. just in life in general, you know? Absolutely. Speaking of joy, um, you are in an interracial relationship and yes. you guys talk <clears throat> on the podcast, you guys talk pretty openly about just, I think all three of you guys are in, uh, interracial relationships, right? Mm -hmm. Um, how has that been, uh, with obviously being black and queer? Yeah. And then being in an interracial relationship, because even for heterosexual people, that's uh, can bring its challenges. But ultimately, it's the most joyous thing for you, right? Um, but what's that? What was that uh, reconciliation process, if any at all, for you uh, with um, deciding to date someone that wasn't black? Yeah, um, you know, it's it's wild. Um, whenever I found myself to be, um, you know, not in a relationship, um, I always felt uh, an intrinsic uh, burning desire to, you know, to, to date within my race. And, um, you know, I've, I've dated in and outside of my race, you know, um, equally. Um, but, you know, the relationship that I'm in right now, um, you know, we've been together for, well, uh, actually, it'll be seven years next week. Um, Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Looks um, like you got a gift to buy. <laughs> oh, we don't do that. Mm -mm. No, <laughs> we don't, no, we don't do that. <laughs> Every day is a gift. So no, we're, no, we're, we're don't, we don't do that. I'm going to have to but, take uh, note of that. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't do that. Um, we don't do like birthday gifts or, you know, anniversary gifts or even, even Christmas gifts because, you know, if we need something, we just get it. You know, if we want to buy something for each other, we just do it. And it's about quality time, da, da, da. But I think that speaks to like my, like my perspective on relationships altogether. For me, it was important that no matter who I'm with, um, they, that there is a, a degree of um, social understanding that, that they're in maturity that they're bringing to the table. Because, um, you know, my partner deeply understands and it deeply understands the plight of and the, the disadvantages that, you know, that, that black people specifically have within, you know, this country and whatnot. And 
you know, as a white guy or whatever. Uh, but he's also, you know, incredibly sympathetic um, and, you know, is an ally, you know, and speaks up and, and, you know, it's not a, this is not a teaching relationship where I'm teaching him how to, you know, how to appreciate us, you know, but he just, he just gets it. Yeah. Um, and for me, like when I think about dating, you know, truly dating for the purpose of a relationship, a long-term relationship, it's important, you know, that, that the person that I'm, you know, that I'm, you know, pursuing, you know, has a, a, a an, an understanding for what our relationship could look like if there is an interracial component to it, you know, mm -hmm. whether, you know, they're, you know, white, Asian, you know, um, Latino or, or Arab or whatever, you know, whatever cultural background they come from, and even black, because even within, you mm -hmm. know, the black community, they, there are, you know, there are cultural differences, you know, yeah. you, you date a black guy from the Bronx is going to be different from dating a black guy who's, you know, from Houston, Texas. Yep. Um, so there are some cultural differences Classes that are, are there. Just depending on, you know, where you grew up, how you grew up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for me, it's about, it's, I, I'm a, um, I, I wouldn't truly classify myself, classify myself as a sapo sapien, sapo, sapo sexual. I think that's what it's called, sapo sexual, where you're attracted to the mind. But I am. I'm very much attracted to how a person thinks, uh, you know, and, you know, what comes out of their mouth and like how their brain works and all that. Like very much attracted to that component. Um, first and then physical attraction comes second for me um but everybody's different so yeah. um spice of life but for the the interracial component of our relationship um you know it's it's comforting to know that when the george floyd things were happening and black life matters things were, were happening and you know there's all this news going on about all these people that are you know that are part of the black community that are you know being shot killed you know just affect it adversely in, in many gross ways that uh, my partner does the work on his own, you know, and comes to the table with a sense of understanding and, and empathy and, and, and support versus, you know, somebody that I have to coach and mold and, and <laughs> monitor. <Yeah. laughs> like, you know, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be with somebody who just, mm -hmm. you, I, where I have to do that amount of work, you know, yeah. I'm, Look, I'm 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 in my 40s. I ain't got time to be messing around. Yeah. This ain't this ain't no no Sesame Street. No. We are, <laughs> look, if we need to educate you on some things, that's fine. If it comes down to like you know how how, how I cook my collard greens, that might be an education component. But when right. it comes down to like you know social injustice, you, you look. You, you gotta get it. You, you gotta get this, <laughs> or you got to go. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was like in those formative months as you're kind of getting to know you know as i was getting to know adam you know like we're we're having all of these very different conversations but i'm listening for you know is this somebody that you know that you know i i can build something with and you know uh seven years later you know we're still building together and supporting one another so it feels good yeah that's awesome that's a great takeaway because i think uh that's the uh, just just you just put that great the yeah, you know, I, the teaching and for them to just come to the table, having done the work to be at the table with you, because yeah. that's a part of what they have to do to function in a relationship with, uh, you know, someone who's black. It's yeah. And I suffer a little bit from black guilt. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. I'm not going to like sugarcoat it. You know, like th the fact that I'm not with a, an, a black gay man, I suffer a little bit from that. Not that I, by any stretch of the measure, regret the relationship that I'm in, but, you know, and just again, intrinsically. So, and I understand the optics, you know, it's like, oh, wow, you know, you're, you know, you, you talk about being pro-black, you're on this pro-black podcast, you, you know, you're, you're doing this, you're doing that, you know, da, 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 but you in a relationship with a white man. <laughs> you know, so it could, <laughs> it, could, it could feel a little like, you know, uh, 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 Candace Owen <laughs> on the surface, <laughs> but it ain't. <laughs> it's a whole other different situation because I am pro-black and I am about, you know, about that, that thing. So, you know, I think it's important for people. This, again, goes back to the conversation we we're having earlier. Like, you know, um, what works for you? What difference does it make what other people think? Yeah. And, you know, I, I think it's it's it's. I feel as uh, intrinsically motivated to support our black community. Like I'm even like today I'm wearing like mm -hmm. this black Queens matter shirt. Like, you know, it's, it's about supporting our community and my relationship with my partner has nothing to do with my impact within the community. I mean, using the platforms that I have professionally, interpersonally, you know, 
yeah. through, within my relationship, friendship circles and acquaintances and whatnot, socially, uh, to elevate the conversation um, around um, you know, the injustice that exists specifically in the United States, specifically within the black community and specifically with the intersectionality of being black and queer. Yeah, but I think the, the uh, even with that, I think it's it's like, well, does anybody uh, does am I still black? <laughs> right, <laughs> I'm still black, right? Right. <laughs> but I, but I, the, the this is the the greatest thing about this conversation is what you pointed out is which is so critical in where people kind of go left. You're with someone who understands you like what you what path you're moving down mm -hmm. because there are black people who are not like pro-black i gotta you know there are some that are not like that right you Absolutely. are so what's required to be with you is someone who is with you understands they're with you which means they can't be going and supporting trump on facebook like <laughs> you, you know what i'm saying so that's but that's the understanding like what are yep. your that like at the end of the day like what are your values i can't i can't I, I can't be with you if you're going to at Christmas dinner and you're talking about like black people are crazy and like nappy <laughs> right. heads and like I so like as long as anybody who kneels at, at the flag, you know, yeah. is not an American and that kind of bullshit. You yeah, know, like you it's know. like as long as we have that understanding, then there's 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 nothing wrong. I think when people and I, I definitely understand what you're saying about, you know, optically, but I think what, what people have to realize is that humans are not that it's, it's not it's not that easy like it's not that mm -hmm. surface it's not it's a, it's a little bit more complicated than that but you understand yeah. that and i think some people who find themselves in interracial relationships don't understand that that's the problem that people have is yeah. that like you're with someone who doesn't get it like they don't they don't understand i feel like the tragedy of our generations you know like this time that we're in everybody not just you know millennials or whatever everybody i feel, feel the tragedy that we're in is that we somehow have this notion and we perpetuate this notion that life is supposed to be like X, whatever X is, you know, if you're, you know, if you're, you're, you're gay and black, uh, you know, or lesbian and black, it's supposed to look like this. Mm -hmm. And life is not supposed to look like anything. Mm -hmm. Life is an experience. And so when we when we spend our time trying to chase after what it's supposed to be like, oh, you know, I'm um, I'm chasing after this kind of career because I want this or because I want people to see me this kind of way or I don't want people to see that, you know, that I'm not this and da 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 da. You know, when you're chasing all that, you know, what the, the opportunity cost of doing that is that you're not living life. Yep. You're not actually living life. And so this notion of, I always say, you know, if it works for you, if you like, if you like, if you like it, I love it, mm -hmm. you know? So if it works for you, it works for you. And I don't have, it doesn't have mm -hmm. to work for me. And I don't even have to have an opinion about whether I like it or not. Mm -hmm. You know, I know people do, mm -hmm. <laughs> people have opinions, but I think the tragedy is, is that, um, again, kind of talk, going back to this notion of like coming out and, and recognizing who you are and, and these kind of gender roles, you know, it's it's all bullshit. And the opportunity cost we have with that kind of thinking is that it stifles people's actual ability to be their authentic selves. Mm -hmm. How many more, how many more Albert Einsteins could this world have seen mm -hmm. had people had the ability to just lean into the things that really served them? Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how many, uh, you know, Bill Gates and 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 other, you know, prolific, you know, like masterminds of their crafts, you know, um, mm -hmm. have we lost and have never been able to fully been able to realize or experience because they weren't able to be their authentic selves. Mm -hmm. You know, and mm -hmm. I think that's really sad. So yeah. the more that we can promote, you know, just understanding that you know, the way that I navigate my life and whoever's along in that journey, friends, partners, family, da, 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 along the way that I navigate that is for me to navigate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you, if you have a problem with it or you don't, it's not aligned with what works for you, that's cool. Like yeah. we don't, we don't have to like swim mm -hmm. in the same lanes together, you know, but let's not try to restrict. Like, I'm not going to say to somebody else, oh, well, you know, I'm in an interracial relationship, an interracial relationship, no, no black person should be in an interracial relationship, you know, right. or, you know, if you're black, you're only, you should only be dating black people, you know, um, I, I'm not going to say that because I'm going to encourage you to, to follow your passion yep. and follow what brings you joy, mm -hmm. as long as it doesn't hurt or infringe on anybody and, else, yeah. anybody else, you know, yeah. do you, 
100%. Do you? That's what the journey's all about. Um, so now, so the podcast, uh, Minority Report. Yes. <laughs> all the aunties <laughs> getting together, having a good old gossipy time. Yeah. Uh, talk about the talk about the show, kind of the origination and uh, yeah. what, where you guys have gone and what you guys have been doing over the last couple of years. Yeah, thank you. You know, we um, so the podcast was the brainchild of um, our our lead host Carell, um, you know, who had been wanting to do a podcast for a long time, um, and um, you know, he had some time, uh, you know, in the midst of the pandemic and whatnot. Um, shortly, actually, short before that, to really kind of think through what that could potentially look like, and um, he and I have always, um, you know, have always had like you know these really interesting long kind of like chat text exchanges and conversations and deep, really deep philosophical conversations. So, you know, he tapped me on the shoulder to see if I wanted to be a part of it. And I, I said, of course, that this sounds like a dope idea. Um, we didn't know what it would be. We didn't have a name for it at that point. We didn't, you know, it was just the, the idea of like, hey, you know, we always have these really interesting conversation. It might be interesting to have, you know, a platform to be able to share that more openly. And so um, he and I are both very, uh, <laughs> verbose <laughs> we're very talkative and so we needed somebody we needed another partner uh who could um you know interject a little bit of punchiness into <laughs> the conversation um and that's where Jarrell came in mm -hmm. and you know uh, he's that that classic capricorn uh that is you know hot and cold so it's either this or that there's no in between whereas you know Carell and I are a little bit more on the gray scale, you know, oh, you know, mm -hmm. there's some differences. Uh, but we've been doing it now for um, a couple of years, um, 150 you know, plus episodes. We record every single week. So our episodes come out every Monday. Um, and, you know, Minority Report is um, it's a real it's a platform to really celebrate and honor the intersectionality between being black and gay, you know. And so as as three black gay men that also are in interracial relationships um you know we wanted to have a a place out there where we can provide representation for just a different lens of what you know being black and queer can look like mm -hmm. and so you know we talk about topics of the day you know what's going on you know that particular week um any anything from like sports to music to you know what's happening in entertainment what's happening socially um you know those tend to be some of our heavier yeah. um conversations but most of it's there's a lot of cackling and laughing going yeah. on. So, uh, and you know, we we we're minority be, uh, minority because we um, we want to really embrace the community and provide a platform that really showcases the diversity of our you know black and queer community. So we bring on guests um, from time to time to share their unique perspectives. You know, we're just one part of a community and we have only mm -hmm. three perspectives out of a gazillion different kinds of perspectives that can mm -hmm. be shared so we're not um you know we're not uh we don't we don't have an ego so high as to say that you know our perspective is the perspective we're very open to like you know bringing in other perspectives in yeah. and exploring things from different points of views so yeah. um so yeah it's it's been a it's been a, a wonderful journey we've um you know we're really proud of of, of using our platform in that kind of way and showing that, you know, that blackness and queerness can, um, you know, can be a source of strength and power. And we, we hope that we provide a little bit of um, inspiration for others, you know, and to pursue whatever is it is that they're, they're passionate about. Yeah. What's well, been one of you guys' like highlight episodes? Oh my God. Um... <laughs> <laughs> or a few. Uh... I think the funniest episode was when I, I took an edible right before um, right before one of the podcasts and um, we were recording early and we typically record around 7 30 8 o'clock at night but this day we were going to be recording at 5 p.m eastern time where I'm at and um, I was like you know what this is great I've had a long ass week I'm gonna I'm gonna take this edible this edible is gonna um, kick in in about an hour, an hour and a half. So by the time we're done with our recording, it'll be kicking in. I, I had a whole gang of like, uh, of documentaries and all just, I was just going to veg out on the sofa and just, you know, live my fantasy. Um, <laughs> I didn't know how strong these were going to be because this was a new, this is like a new batch that I just ordered and of, of, of edibles. And um, I tried another pack, another type from this this lot that I that I purchased um like the weekend prior and it didn't really do anything so I was like okay well you know it says you know like x amount of milligrams but I don't know so I'm just gonna take the whole thing or whatever 
And I kid you not, we started recording and five minutes in, my eyes get like from wide to like, <laughs> like <laughs> this, they start getting all red. And I probably, I had said maybe eight words the entire, I, I'm one of those, those quiet ones. Like I retreat into my head when I get high and fucked up. So, um, <laughs> so I literally was just sitting there just smiling not talking, not saying anything. And uh, I also get really forgetful. Like someone will ask me something and then I'll think of a response. And before it can get to my mouth, I'll forget what that response is because you know, the weed is strong. And so, <laughs> I mean, if you're interested in, in checking out this episode on uh, on YouTube, it's, 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 worth, uh, <laughs> it's worth checking out. Just uh, Google Minority Report, highest one in the room. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so they knew you were hot. Oh my gosh. Oh, and man. they, because I told them right before, I was like, yeah, I took this out. I, I told them, I was like, yeah, I'm taking this edible. I, da, da, da. I gave them the whole spiel or whatever. I was like, it shouldn't kick in for like a whole hour. So I should be good or whatever. And <laughs> they were asking me questions and I was just gone. Yeah, nothing. You just like... gone. So yeah, that, that was, that was a fun one. Wow. That's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right. Well, uh, we've reached the end. Um, what advice do you have for a young person coming up in their own career journey right now? Um, advice that I have for a young person, I would say that um, those feelings that you have um, that you're trying to run away from or you're trying to suppress, um, the more that you can lean into them, the more that your life is going to reward you. Um, and from an advice standpoint, you know, I would say the best thing that I, that I could offer is find a community of people that accept you for who you are. Um, and if you can't find it within your own household, um, you know, there are tons of really great organizations that are out there that to help connect, you know, young queer people, you know, with folks who can mentor them, who can support them and provide a sense of community. Um, so that as you're going through your journey, whatever that is, um, that you're not doing it alone. Because I think that's one of the worst things is when we're trying to go through something and, you know, we feel that we don't have the support and, you know, oftentimes, you know, we don't have enough of the strength on our own to do it by ourselves. So, and even if we do, if you can do it with the support of some people around you to help share that burden, um, you know, it'll make it a lot easier. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. The one for coming on this episode. Um, yeah. You guys can find him. Uh, on IG, you can subscribe to the Minority Report. Um, like you said, they record every Monday. Um, also subscribe to the Queerly Black podcast, uh, YouTube, Instagram, um, everywhere. This has been another episode of the Queerly Black Show. I'm your host, Ashley. I'll catch y'all on the next one.